In this lecture, we are going to talk about why we have seasons on Earth. This beautiful image shows a composite of 17 individual images taken at the same time on dates between early April and mid-September. The scene looks east as the sun is rising over the Caspian Sea. The summer solstice corresponds to when the sun is at the top of the figure eight in the upper left. The time near the winter solstice is when the sun is in the lower right. The figure eight shape arises from a combination of both the Earth's axis tilt and its varying speed as it orbits the sun. Now let's talk about why we experience seasons. True or false, Earth is closer to the sun in summer and farther from the sun in winter. I'll give you a hint. When it's summer in America, it's winter in Australia. You probably guessed false. Seasons are opposite in the northern and southern hemispheres, so distance cannot be the reason. In fact, we're slightly closer to the sun when it's winter in the northern hemisphere than when it's summertime. The real reason for the seasons involves Earth's axis tilt. Earth is pointed at Polaris all year long. That means its orientation relative to the, sun, to the sun must change. If it's pointed at Polaris all year, then it certainly can't be pointed at the sun all year. In June, the northern hemisphere of Earth is tilted towards the sun and the southern hemisphere is tilted away. In December, it's the opposite. When we in the northern hemisphere are tilted towards the sun, the light is more direct and the sun is out longer. It's summertime. To help us mark the changing seasons, we define four special moments in the year, each of which corresponds to four special positions in Earth's orbit. We'll start with the summer solstice, which occurs around June 21st. It's the moment when the northern hemisphere is tipped most directly towards the sun and receives the most direct sunlight. The fall equinox occurs around September 21st. It's the moment when the northern hemisphere first starts to be tipped away from the sun. The winter solstice occurs around December 21st and it's the moment when the northern hemisphere receives the least direct sunlight. Finally, the spring equinox occurs around March 21st. It's the moment, moment when the northern hemisphere goes from being tipped away from the sun to being tipped towards the sun. This figure shows the sun's path on the solstices and equinoxes for someone at about our latitude. On the summer solstice, the sun takes its highest path and rises and sets at north of due east. On the winter solstice, the sun takes its lowest path and rises and sets south of due east. On the equinoxes, the sun rises precisely due east and sets precisely due west. Note that for us, above 23 and a half degrees latitude, the sun never reaches our zenith. It is always south of the zenith, even at noon on the summer solstice. We've been considering seasons from the perspective of someone living in the mid-northern hemisphere of Earth. For folks in the southern hemisphere, the seasons are opposite. Also, the seasonal variation around the times of the solstices are more extreme at high latitudes north or south. For example, Canadians will have longer summer days and longer winter nights than people living in the southern United States. The image here shows the Arctic Circle, where the sun remains above the horizon all day long on the summer solstice and never rises on the winter solstice. On the north and south poles of Earth, the sun is above the horizon for six months in summer and below the horizon for six months in winter. Besides the daily rotation of Earth and its yearly revolution around the sun, there's another motion of our planet that we haven't talked about. This one just takes a bit longer. The movement is called precession, and it's the gradual wobble of Earth's axis. Precession is caused by gravity's effect on a tilted, rotating object that is not a perfect sphere. You've probably seen this effect if you've ever spun a top and watched it wobble. Earth is not a perfect sphere, and it's being tugged on gravitationally by the sun and the moon. This causes the wobble, and it takes a long time to make one wobble, over 26,000 years. It means our axis gradually points to different parts of the sky. 
Polaris hasn't always been, and it won't always be, our pole star. In Egyptian times, the star Thuban in the constellation of Draco was closest to the pole. In the future, in 15,000 AD, Vega will be our pole star. Precession also has consequences for astrology. The zodiac constellations were defined several thousand years ago by the Babylonians. Because of precession, the sky has shifted. The sun is not in the same constellations on the same dates as it was in the time of the Babylonians. For example, the sun used to be in the constellation of Aries on the vernal equinox. Now it's in Pisces. This means the astrological signs are all off. The dates you see in the newspaper aren't really the days the sun is in that zodiac constellation. This table shows where the sun really is. Note also that there are 13 constellations, not 12. If your birthday happens to be between November 30th and December 17th, your star sign is actually Ophiuchus. My birthday is December 14th, so I'm a very proud Ophiuchian. Ophiuchus comes into the mix uh, mostly because of the borders that were defined in 1928 by the International Astronomical Union. I've used Stellarium to take us back in time several thousand years. So this is the sky in the year 1000 BC, and the sun is at the vernal equinox. And you can see clearly that it's in the constellation of Aries. Here's the sky in 2014 on the vernal equinox, and you can see that the sun is now in the constellation of Pisces. Now I've moved the sky to 3000 AD, far in the future, and it's the vernal equinox and the sun is in the constellation of Aquarius. So here it finally is the age of Aquarius. We have covered a lot again, so take a break, maybe even go outside and look at the sky for real.